So I'll tell you about how Copernicus helped us out substantially when we tried to uh, promote a global definition of urbanization. Um, we started this work six years ago uh, at the Habitat 3 conference in Quito. Uh, there was no global definition of what was a city, but there were lots of things that we needed to measure in cities and in rural areas. So we thought, let's come up with a global definition. And you can see the timeline. We had a whole bunch of meetings with experts uh, in various locations, FAO, ILO, UN Habitat joined this work together with the OECD and World Bank, and we got it endorsed by the UN in 2020, which is, you know, for statistical work, this is high speed. Uh, we published a manual and right now we're working with countries to implement it across the globe. Now, why did we do it and why was it so hard? I mean, it's surprising that you have to wait for the 21st century to agree on what's urban and rural. Now, if you look at this place, this is an urban area. If you purely define them based on population size, because this Plockton only has a small population, but it's part of a larger municipality, Highland Council, which has over 200,000 inhabitants. So you would guess that must be urban. So how do you fix this? Well, you use population density, but then this is a rural area. This is Ulaanbaatar, 1.4 million, so definitely big enough to be urban, but because it's part of a large municipality, it has a very low density, so it becomes rural. So those two methods don't work, so what do you do? You need something which has the same shape and size everywhere. And the population grid came to our rescue, and so, here you can see Venendaal in the Netherlands, and you can see two little um, you know, settlements here on the grid map, because these are density maps. But here you can only see one, because this one's part of a larger municipality. So with the grid, you can see all settlements much more clearly. But to have a population grid is a challenge. Some countries, like most European countries, have a, a census that's geocoded, or a geocoded population register, and then you can create a, a, a grid based on the data that's uh, point-based, but most countries have to rely on a disaggregation grid. And this is where remote sensing comes in. Uh, you take population from enumeration areas and you combine that with remote sensing data, ideally continuous data that captures the presence of buildings, but you can also do work with cadastral data, building registers, or, or land use maps. So this is just a simple uh, representation how you do this. This is the share of area covered by buildings at a grid level. We use GHSL, no Thomas presented earlier to you today. Then you combine this with census population. We cut this from season from Columbia University, and then we combine it. We put people in the buildings and then we get a grid. It's relatively simple. And I've got a very nice animation that the colleagues did. So here you get some satellite imagery of Bangkok. Then you turn that into the share built up uh, and you identify water. Then you take the census units with population. Uh, so this is the population counts in those places, population density rather. And then you combine those two and then you get units with the same size, right? And then you can see all the settlements, but this is a continuous grid. So you need to discrete, make it discrete. And this is what we do with a degree of urbanization. The red are cities, the orange are towns and semi-dense areas. And you can see that on the outskirts of all the cities there and the green are rural areas. This is how it works. We also have a metropolitan definition or functional area definition where we create commuting zones around cities, but we can't measure commuting with uh, remote sensing yet. So we're struggling a little bit there. Together with FAO, we created a second level of degree of urbanization uh, where we split the rural areas and villages, dispersed rural and mostly uninhabited, and we split the towns from the semi-dense areas, which are suburban or peri-urban areas. Now, this was important to do um, because what we figured out as part of this work, and thanks to GHSL, we could estimate the population by degree of urbanization for all countries, and we could compare it to the nationally defined uh, urban areas. And we found two things. Some countries think that only very large settlements should be considered urban. So typically they focus on cities alone and don't include the towns and suburbs. And others include smaller areas, typically in North in the Americas and Europe, you know, a town of 5,000 is considered urban. So there you see that the nationally defined urban areas match cities plus towns and suburbs and much more. And so this, you know, using the same term urban to 
uh, identify radically different area created a lot of confusion. But there's one area where there was less confusion. We tend to agree on where large cities are. Large cities are fairly easy to identify. You can also easily see them from space. And so here in the red bars, you see the nationally defined cities uh, over 300,000 as a share of total population. And then in dark purple, you see what our cities over 300,000 look like. And in most cases, we really agree very much. Um, only in North America, they define their cities as agglomerations, which includes their suburbs. And so they get much higher population shares. And the same is true as in Australia and New Zealand. But so overall, we clearly agree what a large city is, but we don't agree what urban is. So that's why it was useful to create something which was continuous, which was harmonized, which could be uh, easily defined everywhere. And so before wrapping up, and I think I did it fairly quickly, so there might be some questions. Um, what I really want to stress is that, you know, remote sensing has made all this possible. Without remote sensing, we wouldn't have a population grid. We wouldn't have a global definition. We were able to go to countries across the world, and we're still doing that today, and show them our estimates of what their degree of urbanization would look like. Then we work with them to get access to uh, usually better population data, more recent with a finer spatial resolution so that we can get a more precise population grid. And then we reapply the method. method. And, and it's really um, been been a great success. And, 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 and we see a, a growing number of countries applying this from Australia to South Africa to Brazil, Mexico, Kenya, Tunisia, you name it. We've been talking to lots of countries in the run up to this endorsement with UN Habitat. We consulted over 80 countries and now we're bilaterally working with countries to make sure that they can implement uh, this definition. But wrapping up, um, there was clearly a, a, a policy demand for this definition you've got the sustainable development goals with lots of requests to collect urban rural and city data the action framework to implement the new urban agenda afinua from un habitat again lots of urban indicators and also the agricultural data um, also requests to collect a lot of rural data so there was a demand but it was only through this new instrument population grid that we were able to crack this uh resistant definition and the remote sensing really played a massive role in just facilitating this conversation because we came up not just with a recipe of how to uh, define urban we actually implemented that recipe with our own estimates to kind of show it's probably going to look something like this. Obviously, our um, estimates are approximations. Um, we would need better data, better grids, especially uh, better population data. Um, but having that remote sensing data and having those estimated population grids made all the difference in the world. Um, and it was quite a challenge to keep six international organization agreeing that this was a good idea, but we managed and uh, we're very happy to have that endorsement. And now we're working on the implementation and we'll re report back to the UN in the years to come on that implementation. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Louis. Uh, so here a clear um proof that the gssl part of uh, copernicus is uh, obviously very useful um i just wondered how you see this uh, as an evolution and an improvement of uh, gssl which is already a very uh, i would say powerful tool but where you see still uh, some improvements that you would find um, uh, interesting and uh, maybe i hit something on heights of buildings formal informal settlements uh, and so forth would would that be of interest so when it comes to creating a population grid, um, the one I've shown you and that we've used so far was built based on built share built up, share built up area. So that was a two dimensional approach to say measuring buildings, having building height would actually make it three dimensional and would be much better in capturing those high density uh, uh, buildings or those, those multi-story buildings you typically find in city centers. So for us, that's definitely the new frontier. Um, GHSL, the more recent version 2.0 includes estimates of building height. So I think that's gonna really help. Um, 
Also, the distinction between residential and non-residential that they've introduced can also really substantially improve so that we don't assign a lot of population what are essentially warehouses or shopping malls or you know, uh, industrial buildings. So I think that, and again, is, is a very important distinction. And as we get better data, better remote sensing data, higher resolution remote sensing data, identifying those really large buildings becomes becomes more feasible and building height is, is critical when it comes to formal and informal this one is challenging um, there are a number of criteria which we may hope indeed to be able to identify from remote sensing such as you know very small uh, the, the type of constructions very small buildings very um, small road infrastructure informal road infrastructure so not very straight and not very wide but there's a whole other set of criteria which comes with type of ownership uh type of facilities you know access to water electricity etc which is which are much harder to to capture nevertheless i do think uh, there would be a, a strong interest in being able to identify uh informal settlements as well but there i think we will only be able to capture some aspect of that uh, of that definition one of the more curious discussions we had uh, uh, was whether a refugee camp was a city or not. <laughs> because quite a few of them have a large population uh, and some of them have been there for years. So it was a bit of a philosophical debate. But if you define a settlement as a concentration of permanent population and space, and if they have been there for a long time, but then actually, you know, refugee camp to some degree is a settlement. Yeah, and uh, I can give you an example. It's very dense. The Dadaab refugee camp uh, in Kenya uh, is already there for 40 years and has, uh, I mean, this is not in a way, not a, it's still a refugee camp, but it's basically becoming a city, you know, it's like, and super dense, that's a fact. And I think it's all informal settlements there, there you can be sure of of it as well exactly okay um we are perfectly in time and thanks a lot for these further clarifications Louis. and uh okay if there are no other questions i don't see them in the slido um we can go to the next uh, session so i'll close here thank you thank you bye bye okay Peter. i guess we can just move ahead with the next session, which is the, the last of today. So I think it is a very interesting session because from the beginning of the conception of Copernicus, the idea was to look at the synergies and cooperation among the different services. And our session now is on partnership and synergies within the Copernicus ecosystem, which is all the uh, ecosystem services that are in place now. We have uh, four presentations today with uh, around 15 minutes each, and then maybe some time for questions at the end of the session or after each of the, the presentations, depending on how it goes. The first presentation is on Copernicus uh, Marine Environment Monitoring Service, and it is by Pierre Elletron from Mercator Ocean. Are you uh, there, Freddy? Really? Yes, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, if you can share the screen, perfect. Okay. See you now, yes, you. Oh, please just go ahead. Very good. We see the presentation. If you can put it in the center small. Perfect. Is it okay? Do you yeah. see the slide? Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay, so thanks a lot um, for this invitation. So we are very pleased to be here today with you to for this discussion on the uh, uh, interface links of uh, emergency management service with the other services on the Copernicus Marine Service in particular. So this is a pre short presentation I prepared with uh, with Angelique uh, Mullet at Mercator Ocean International. Uh, Just maybe just to remind you very briefly uh, what uh, Copernicus Marine Service is. So we are uh, dealing with global and regional uh, ocean monitoring and forecasting. Uh, this is both, I mean, for the uh, the past, I mean, uh, multi-year data sets, uh, real-time and short-term forecast, uh, dealing with all essential marine variables for the physics, sea ice, and biogeochemistry, and with observation and numerical model. 
So this is part of the activity we organize uh, together with uh, a series of producers in Europe. Uh, and also every year we uh, produce an ocean state report. This is a peer review publication on a summary, uh, high level summary for uh, policymakers on, on general public. Um, Sorry. Uh, so in terms of user application, user uptake, so we know have uh, almost, uh, we are close to 50,000 uh, uh, subscribers to the service, a lot of visitors to the website. So we are serving a wide range of application, uh, environment, society, and economies that I will not detail here, but this is a, uh, has been developed uh, quite, uh, quite well over the past uh, couple of years. So in terms of our plan for Copernicus 2, which is really the uh, objective of discussion today, so we, of course, as all services of uh, Copernicus, uh, the, the key first aspect is to ensure the, the continuity of what we have, but we progressively improve the service with enhanced information on service, uh, with digital integration, and we also plan to have reinforced link with other services. So this is uh, very timely to have this uh, roundtable today to discuss this further with the uh, emergency management uh, service. So in terms of uh, our activities, some also it's really a continuity of the, of the baseline on a series of major evolutions that we will develop through precursor project. Uh, and then whether we possibly implementing depending on budget on, on, on priority. What, a key aspect is what we do for coastal, which is quite relevant of the activity with the uh, interface with the uh, emergency management service. And this is something that we want to develop first through uh, a national collaboration partnership with the member state for coastal marine activities. Uh, and also linking different activities, and I will come back to this with the other services. Okay, so more precisely, I mean, the interface of uh, on synergy with the emergency management service. Um, I mean, we have a series, and we have been uh, enjoying a regular discussion with the uh, emergency management service over the past couple of years. On the, uh, there is a, we are working together as part of the XFAS uh, uh, projects, so this is a research and development project, uh, but that could possibly lead as a, a coastal flood forecasting management and recovery system implemented by uh, by the emergency management service. And here we are working on a, uh, the uh, provision of a European sea level and wave forecast products from the Copernicus Marine Service that could uh, become a regular input of this system. So this is a very important project for us, and we are working together hard as part of this uh, ECFAS, and we'll see then uh, what uh, will be implemented uh, as an operational service. But we are uh, on our side quite ready to continue to work on this provision, including what we uh, uh, for making sure that there is a link within between the two two services. On the other side, I mean, we are also using product from the emergency management service, in particular for river model, model products, because all the Copernicus mine models that we use, of course, they have to be forced by river outflow. Uh, so we are testing, and we started to test with our modeling centers, uh, the impact of uh, EFAS uh, river model, model output. So this is something well, that we will continue, including with the coupling of uh, with coastal models that are operated by member states. Uh, and this will be done through our service evolution research and development program, also Horizon Europe project. Another topic of interaction between the two services is a Copernicus thematic hubs. Uh, on the thematic hubs, as you know, they will gather the ensemble of information generated by several Copernicus services for a given topic. Uh, Mercator Ocean International leads the coastal on an Arctic hub. Uh, and we'll be using the Wikio infrastructure. So we are just starting design studies and we'll interact very soon with, uh, with you, uh, in particular for, uh, the, for the thematic hub on, on coastal, where, I mean, of course, there are uh, uh, clear links to be made uh, with uh, what you do at the level of, uh, of the emergency management service. <coughs> so this will be very important uh, activity to, uh, uh, highlight, I mean, how Copernicus as a whole contribute to the coastal zone management, both for the marine and the land, with uh, its different services, and of course also the uh, Sentinel uh, Sentinel data sets. So just to summarize, <coughs> my uh, so we want to continue uh, interacting with the emergency management service and to uh, strengthen the cooperation. Our main, I mean, uh, philosophy here is to make sure that we provide all the required ocean or coastal ocean products that are required or will be required uh, 
for the, uh, the emergency management service. So typically the example of European sea level and wave forecast. Uh, we also want to make the best use of the emergency management service products and services. So in particular, this uh, river model outputs uh, and work together on this uh, Copernicus cross service offer. So for Copernicus thematic hubs and in particular coastal where there are obvious uh, uh, links to, to be made. That was all for my short presentation. Very good. Very good. Thank you, uh, Clarine. I don't see any questions. I had a couple of general questions ready for the speakers in case we didn't get questions from the audience. One, uh, very good that you mentioned the thematic hub, uh, which will kind of gather together all the products that are relevant for a given area, for instance, for the Arctic. My question is on, also on data. Are you, in addition to the Copernicus and Emergency Services, are you sharing products or data with any other services? Or would you benefit from getting access to data or services that you don't yet have in, in place in, in also in the Is there some relationship or interest from your service to connect with other ecosystem uh, and net services in, in so, so I think the, the first I mean, uh, objective of the thematic hub is to make sure that we uh, provide visibility and access to all data from all Copernicus services and of course relying on the different services because they will continue but just to have this uh, this portal and uh, the good point is that the WKO infrastructure allows uh, uh, us to do to do to do it then we could uh, add uh, additional data sets on products outside the Copernicus services, but this, I think, will probably be in, in the next step. Typically, for the coastal in marine, we have a lot of discussion with the Imonet or uh, other initiative in Europe. But uh, we have to try. I mean, we are really at this uh, for thematic hub. It's really uh, working at first on proof of concept, so not to on going very, uh, re very uh, progressively. I mean. Uh, even that, I mean, those thematic hub I mean, uh, uh, will be uh, developed as a best, more as a best effort basis. So that this is why we we will we have to move progressively. But you had in mind a specific uh, products on. A... Well, um, thinking about the Arctic, because there are so many activities about the, around the Arctic. There are I mean, on on potential emergency. We will be working on pirates, for instance, on yeah. pollution that may yeah, yeah. come through the flow into the ocean. Of course, uh, but it's clear for us that for the Arctic, I didn't mention the Arctic thematic hub, but Arctic thematic hub, of course, the emergency management service will, will have to contribute for sure. I mean, that's uh, uh, on, on, on this is, but we didn't, we have to start this interaction with you to look for these two, uh, for these two uh, thematic hubs, uh, what would be the contribution of, uh, of emergency management. So, of course, it's not only the coastal, the Arctic is. Uh, yeah. Oh, definitely. No, I was thinking also. Mm -hmm. Copernicus land is computing by physical parameters, probably also yeah. in the ocean. Yeah. That could be of use, but yeah. very, very good. I mean, the example that you provided, the one yeah. that you have already on coastal plots, yeah. is very clean of you. And for, maybe for the Arctic, just to remind, there is a large uh, Horizon Europe uh, project, Arctic Passion, that is developing a Copernicus window. And, uh, and so we are interacting with them because this is also, we see it as a joint activity and this is well understood also at the level of uh, DGRTD and DGDFIS. Well, thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the our audience. So we can pass to the next speaker. Thank you again. And the next presentation is by the, by Henrik Andersen from the European Environment Agency uh, on the European Ground Motion Service. So, Henrik, whenever you're ready, please. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we do. Okay, yes. I will share my slides, hopefully. Okay, can you see my slides now? Yes, yes, we can. Good. Okay. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I'm Henry Stenanis. I'm from the European Environment Agency, and I'm responsible for the implementation of the European Ground Motion Service. So, so what is the European Ground Motion Service? Uh, it's a continental scale homogeneous map of ground motion. I mean, this is a first in the world. I have to say it's the first time that we see 
a construction of a map like this on a continental scale. It's a really a lot of data based on Sentinel-1 from Copernicus. So it's it's a huge, huge data set. Uh, it delivers millimeter per year precision, full time series included. ETMF map, uh, ETMS maps and measures ground uh, infrastructure displacement, including those caused by landslide subsidence and tectonics. So this is a product that is going to be updated on an annual basis. Currently, we have data from 2015 until 2020. So when we talk about emergency management, this is really not um, a, a tool for real time monitoring. This this is this is not how this 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 product is going to be used. However, I mean you can easily imagine that you can use these data to identify areas where you need to do more monitoring, more often monitoring, more detailed monitoring. You can also easily imagine that you can use these data for post-event analysis, where you need to go in depth about I mean what actually caused this this uh, this uh, this geo hazard, for example, and uh, and can we find other places where something similar may 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 happen in the future. So there's a lot of potential here. This is a new data set. The first product was released in May this year. Uh, and next product was released in August, and we will now also uh, release uh, more data uh, this week and next week. So this is really a, a product uh, which is starting up, and we need, of course, to work very closely together to ensure that actually we will benefit from these data uh, in the best uh, in the best possible way uh, and of course we will work with the Europe, with the um, uh, Copernicus emergency management service as well as we will work with national uh, national uh, services and other communities to try to make the best out of these data um, Copernicus products, of course, I mean, and, and this is also the case for for ETMS freely and openly available to everybody. Uh, you can see these data in what we call the ETMS Explorer. You will be able to download the data uh, quite soon, hopefully next week, in fact. Uh, I know that there's a lot of users actually asking for this, um, and, and, and this will be possible uh, next week. That is the plan. And this service is actually part of what we call the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service. So this is where you can find information about the service and where you can also uh, 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 get access to the to the viewer and also hopefully next week to the archive. The overall responsibility of this is delegated to the uh, European uh, in Environment Agency. Uh, but I have to say that this service is really implemented by leading INSA and ground motion experts in Europe. I mean, we have a lot of people involved in this. Uh, we have also a quite a full setup. Uh, so we have the production team uh, working on, on, on producing the data. We have their validation team, and I'll come back to that a little later, uh, that will actually do the independent validation of the product. We have an advisory board that, that advises uh, the EA about uh, the uh, quality of the product, how it should evolve. And then, of course, we work very closely with a number of user groups in, in Europe, and we will do much more uh, awareness raising user uptake activities in 2023. Uh, uh, so, so, so there will be uh, many chances to have a discussion about how, how, how we best can, can, can use these data. So in terms of product, what do we have actually available? So we have three different products where well, we have basic, calibrated and auto. So when you look at the at the viewer, and in most cases, what you are going to use will be the calibrated one. So ground motion data, um, satellite line of sight, uh, but they are referenced to the GNSS frame. Uh, it's full resolution Sentinel-1. And this is probably a product that you will use uh, a, a, a lot of the time. On the other hand, a more easy uh, accessible product, easy understandable pro product would be the auto product, which is actually a reprojection of the, of the, of the calibrated data into a east-west component and a vertical component. So I'll show you some examples later, some nice, nice images. Um, but this, this is easier to understand. But also, you will need, you will, you'll have to accept a, 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 a resolution of 100 meter. So, 
what would be the key application areas? So this is also something that was actually defined before we started implementing the service. So what kind of application areas should we try to focus on? So natural and man-made induced view hazards, low likes, uh, like, like landslides, uh, substance, for example, activities in mining areas and civil engineering. And of course, uh, uh, you can do you can you can get part of the way when we talk about civil engineering, uh, when we when we when we look at data like this. I mean, buildings, roads, bridges, railways. Yes, you can see them, uh, but you may need uh, more detailed information if you want to really go into uh, into into the details. Uh, but again, you can use ETMS as a starting point to identify areas where you need to to uh, to to get more information. So for for just to 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 show you a few examples, and I'm not going to go into detail because this uh, the time will not allow that. So so uh, so uh, just a few examples, some nice images. Uh, you can see uh, you can see here that we have this auto product. So it's it's 100 meter. It's a 100 meter product, and you can see here that we are looking at the east west component. So uh, we can see. Uh, At least I cannot hear Henrik. And I, you can see. I, yeah, Jesus, I confirm and um, he's uh, offline. Okay, so let's just wait a little. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's just wait a little bit, see if he's coming Sorry. back. Can, can, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yeah, we'll just do for a, for a minute. Oh, ah, please. okay, okay, sorry, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, we so, on the also photo, I mean, also product. Yeah, okay, so, 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 yeah, so this, what you're looking at here is an auto product, um, and, uh, and, uh, this is the, yeah, okay, I can move one back. So, this is the auto product east west component. So, you will see in red things moving to the west, in blue things moving to the east. Uh, this is from a uh, an area in Italy, earthquake area in Italy, August 2016, uh, and and uh, here you can see uh, the the full time series from 2015 until 2020, and you can see there's a lot of information. There's a clear accident or a, or or a clear event in 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 20 in 2016. We can see this in in the data. Uh, also, if you look at the same area and you look at the vertical component, so here we are looking at if things are going up or down. So in this case, red will be down, up, blue will be up. Um, you can have also uh, uh, the uh, uh, in some in some areas with uh, volcanic volcanic uh, eruptions, volcanic uh, activity. Again. If you look at the auto product uh, 100 meter, you can have the vertical movement and you can have the east west movement. So, I mean, really, really, uh, uh, I think beautiful images. And I would, uh, I would, uh, I, I think it would be good. I mean, if you could go to our viewer and you can try to look for the same data, you can look in other areas. I mean, you will, you will automatically see these data, and you can also plot the time series uh, to to uh, to see the the gradual change over the years. Um, and this, uh, I think, is the final one. So really, I mean, you know, Etna, the volcano in Chile. And again, a very beautiful image. A lot of information. There's a, there's there are many stories to be told about this uh, about these images. So so uh, I hope that this um, will uh, uh, in the future next year already hopefully will trigger a lot of interesting uh, uh, studies. Um, uh, there's a wealth of information hidden in in these data. Uh, again uh, again auto product uh, vertical. I will move forward again. Uh, landslides is going to be a key area where where many people will try to see what they can get from these data. So this is an example from the French Pyrenees, uh, and you can see also this is a 3D view, in fact, and this is this is uh, this is how our look our, our viewer explorer will look in a 3D version in a 3D um, uh, setting. Uh, so you can have the uh, the uh, elevation model combined with the data, and you will you will get a better feeling about what you're looking at. 
Uh, again, this is from Tromsø, and you can see that uh, in this case, uh, if you look at the time series, uh, there's no data when there is snow. Uh, and of course, also, unless you do some special treatment, uh, what EGMS is good at is detecting gradual, gradual changes, no abrupt changes. So for the earthquake, for example, we had to do a lot of um, special, special uh, treatment. Uh, again, Tromsø in Norway, gaps is due to the snow cover. This is also about landslides. And yeah, so just before I end, um, we we think that actually validating these data uh, is extremely uh, important. And that's why we have a separate team looking at the validation of the product. And they have established a number of validation sites in Europe. They are working with a lot of experts in Europe, completely independent from the production team. And here, in fact, the, the basic idea behind this is to validate the usability of the product. So it's not about redoing what the production team is already verifying, namely that the product is living up to the, um, to the, uh, to the specifications, but this is really about usability. So can we actually detect the landslides that users are interested in? What can we do in mining areas and so on and so forth? Uh, and also, of course, if you need to, 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 to have access to background information, I would especially uh, recommend the product user manual where we try to guide you to what can these data be used for and what should you not use them for. Uh, so, so we try to, to guide and of course, this will be a living document. This will, this will be improved uh, along the time. We have a lot of other information, so the quality control report, uh, verifying the um, the uh, the match with the spec with the specifications. We have all the background, the theoretical background, and we have also all the information you need to actually understand the product and the format uh, when you're going to download uh, download the data. So if if you want to look more, you have to go to the land monitoring service. You have to choose the uh, the uh, the uh, European uh, uh, ground motion service and and on that page you will see a lot of interesting information um, but and I hope uh, we will uh, be able to add a number of use cases including use cases that are really relevant for the emergency management service in Europe and, and elsewhere and that's up all for me thanks a lot thank you very much Enric. Yeah, very interesting uh, product, but I was not uh, familiar with the, with the product itself. I mean, I knew that it existed, but all the details. Uh, I did have a, I don't see any questions from the audience. I did have the same question that I did to Pierre. Um, is there something that you think you could benefit from, from other services or the other way around, uh, some service that you think you can really feed into? In the second one, I, I would mention later on an application that I think could be of use for you, but just to see yeah. your opinion on this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly uh, uh, now when we when we uh, uh, I'm I'm presenting at the um, so, uh, Copernicus Emergency Management uh, General Assembly, of course, um, it is our intention to. Uh, to uh, to have uh, and and to work uh, closely with you to see how you can actually make the best out of these data and how we can we can work together to maybe even improve the product in in the future uh, this 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 is clear so so this is not a this not we should not see this as a standalone product uh, this this is something we can hopefully uh, uh, use in combination with other products from other services uh, but again i think I mean, the potential is there, but we need we need to 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 uh, to to be uh, 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 we need to explore this together with our users to see. I mean, what kind of link could we make to climate uh, ch climate change? What kind of link could we could we do? I mean, with um, uh, urban development, infra critical infrastructure, things like that. I mean, there are many possibilities, and 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 we we will we will really try to explore them. Now, now that we have, I mean, within the in, in in within this or next week, we will have the full baseline product available. 
and then we will really start trying to to uh, to to uh, yeah we will we will investigate a lot of resources in 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 user uptake and awareness raising and in collaboration with you and other uh, interested people. Thank you. So if in the meantime, we've got a question uh, from the audience from uh, Martin, and he's asking if there is a plan for EGNS to go global. Um, well, no, no, there is no plan for that. Uh, it it would probably be a quite uh, a, a task to do that, uh, but um, uh, I know that um, in in North America they are actually looking to us to see how this could be done in North America. So there may be uh, teams working on this elsewhere, but for the moment, in within Copernicus, the idea is not to move outside Europe. Uh, I could personally, I mean, but this is probably uh, for the future. It would be interesting when we talk about climate change to see how much we can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis permafrost in the Arctic area. Uh, uh, that could be an interesting uh, issue. Uh, some research is definitely needed. Um, and we are also looking forward to um, to Rose L, uh, which will actually add yet another component to this, um, the l band SAR. But um, uh, but for the moment, uh, the the uh, the European Ground Motion Service will stay in Europe, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah. Thank you. In the meantime, my colleague Alfred de Jagger just mentioned that this subsidence can be probably coupled with drought, as for specific yeah. areas. And exactly. On, and yeah. on the other yeah. side, I was about to mention that we are uh, assessing. The potential soil loss after wildfires. In many cases, these wildfires are linked to landslides. Yep. That is yep. an interesting, at least interesting input for you to look, look at this yep. area. Yeah. No, I mean they, they. They. I mean, in one one of one of the slides, I mean, there's this famous uh, uh, substance area in Bologna. Where you can clearly see uh, water extraction, so there is a clear water water signal in 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 the data, and it would be interesting to to combine this with uh, with drought. Clearly, yes. Okay. So thank you very much again, Andre, and then we can pass to the next speaker, uh, that is Jose Miguel Rubio Iglesias from the EEA, and he will be presenting uh, us the public reference data access uh, Corda. Please, Jose Miguel. Hello, good good afternoon. I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, okay. You can see? Yes. Uh, okay. Is it? Please yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, it's my the first time I am attending a Copernicus emergency. Uh, service uh, assembly. I am recently joined the Copernicus team here at the European Environment Agency, and I worked together with Henrik, the previous speaker, in uh, the cross-service coordination of access to in situ data, which is basically what we we know as Copernicus in situ component. Um, we I will of course uh, refer to the Copernicus uh, reference data access portal, which is one of the activities that we. Uh, manage that we lead here in the context of Copernicus in situ component, but I, I wanted also to to navigate through some other activities that are of relevance to the different Copernicus service, in particular to the emergency service. Uh, but I didn't want to jump uh, to the activities that we are doing uh, as coordinators of this activity um, without highlighting something that uh, we have heard uh, across the full day um, about the importance of in situ data. Um, key user requirements uh, of Copernicus uh, cannot be met without essential in situ data. Of course, it's very important, the satellite imagery, and uh, but uh, definitely in situ data is fundamental to to for the success of the program and when we meet and when we what we mean with copernicus in situ data is basically uh, observation data um, from ground born uh, seaborne airborne sensors as well as a uh, reference and ancillary data licensed and provided uh, or provided for use in copernicus geospatial data uh, vector maps uh, out of uh, coming from national mapping agencies etc so for uh, what is the purpose of using this in situ data? Uh, all Copernicus services require in situ data for uh, 
producing and validating their products. And also the Copernicus Space Component requires in situ data for calibration and validation of Sentinel observation. Uh, when we speak about in situ data here in the Copernicus in situ component, we typically classify the in situ data in geospatial data, which is basically data about, for example, geospatial data on, on transport networks, uh, settlements, industry, location of industry facilities. Uh, second type will be the environmental observations, uh, such as measurements on temperature, uh, aerosol concentrations, waves radiation, salinity, and a third group, uh, very important as well, are uh, what we uh, name as fiducial reference measurement. It's very, pre very precise and um, fully characterized uh, measurements for uh, calibration. Uh, the basic principle of in situ data in Copernicus is that Copernicus doesn't own in, on its own an in situ network, but will rely on existing in situ data capacities that exist in, in member states, uh, national, at European, and at global level. Uh, this in situ data comes from national data owners, national data providers, for example, national uh, mapping agencies or meteorological agencies in the different countries, or are coming from different networks, uh, European research infrastructures, uh, associations, organizations, and, and so on. Uh, given the importance of in situ data, it's, it's clear that Copernicus needs to work with a number of networks, organizations, and infrastructure at uh, this at European and global level to get access to this data that, that is um, heavily needed. Uh, when it comes to in situ data uh, on an operational level, typically the different Copernicus entrusted entities are in charge of getting access to, to the in situ data that they need uh, as an integrated part of their work. Uh, where is EA, European Environment Agency, entering into the picture in this context is when it's needed a coordinated approach at a um, programmatic level. Let's see, when we need to engage with data providers which are providing uh, data which is uh, needed across different services or uh, as well to try to compile a, um, a landscape and a picture and an overview of the different requirements of uh, for in situ data from the different services. Uh, this translates in basically four areas of activities that the EA uh, carries out together with a series of, of uh, in situ experts consortia. And the first area is what we call the, uh, the determination of the state of play of in situ data. Here we are uh, providing an overview of the in-situ data uh, requirements from the different uh, services, the use of in-situ data, the challenges, and this is all compiled and available through the Copernicus In-Situ Component Information Service, CS Square. Um, the second area of activity is actually providing uh, in an operational uh, basis uh, access to selected in situ data uh, according to the requirements from the, from the Copernicus services. And this we do through the Copernicus Reference Data Access Porta Corda. Uh, as I said before, another important activity that the EA has in the context of this, this um, Copernicus in situ component is engaging with data providers. And that's, uh, that's another of the, of the strands of our activities, trying to uh, liaise with uh, associations uh, uh, such as, for example, Eurogeographic or UMEDNET in, or in order to improve the access to in situ to data for the interest in the interest of the services. And finally, another area of activity is providing support and advice to the European Commission and entrusted entities in relation to uh, in situ data. So I just wanted to mention briefly uh, that we um, have uh, recently published and it's available now uh, for uh, the general public. It was already made available, of course, for the different Copernicus service, the Copernicus Institute component uh, information system, CS Square, that I mentioned be before. This uh, platform provides uh, an overview of the different requirements uh, of the different uh, products from the Copernicus portfolio versus the Institute data, which is available. Uh, and uh, the different data providers, as well as the level of compliance of this data vis-a-vis -vis the requirements that the Copernicus products uh, have. With all this information, we have created a series of fact sheets, uh, reports. We have also published uh, the um, 
a state of play of the in-situ um, of in situ component of Copernicus. All this is available through our website in institute.copernicus.eu. I wanted to extract uh, a bit of the information related to the Copernicus emergency uh, a service that we have in CS Square and all our fact sheets. Uh, we provide, uh, as I said before, the uh, series of list of requirements uh, coming from the different service. Here you can see uh, a list of uh, summary of the different requirements from the mapping component and the early warning component vis-a-vis -vis institute data, why it is necessary to have access to institute data. Well, for, for you, it's, it's definitely obvious no? uh, to, to ensure that we reduce the delivery time of the final products, to increase the thematic and geometric accuracy, to provide input to the models, to um, update and accurate the baseline data, and so on. Uh, given the nature as well of, of Copernicus Emergency Service, uh, there is a wide uh, in-situ data requirements in, in terms of types of data that are required, typically falling under what we call geospatial data, data providing provided in most cases by national and mapping, national mapping agencies, but also observational data. No? We have, we have here a list of, of key institute data um, which are required by the by the different products from settlements, from location of industry and utilities, hydrography, transport network, and, and so on and so on. All this information, as I said, is made available through the uh, Copernicus in situ website. Uh, and it's been reviewed and is reviewed on a regular basis by our experts. Uh, we are also trying to compile, we have, we have tried to do that and we are pursuing this in the future as well to compile a series of use cases and stories about how in situ data is being used in the different Copernicus services in order to promote and to reach the data providers and to raise awareness about the importance of in situ data. No? For example, here I took uh, a few Examples of act mapping activations from the emergency service. One case, uh, for example, here on a forest fire in Sardinia, how important it is to have a reliable mapping of transport networks for uh, so so relief force can be targeted on the most important places. We also have uh, here other examples about um, uh, the importance of uh, elevation, transport network, and population in uh, landslide risk assessment after a forest fire in Madeira. We have also uh, mapping activation in Croatia, uh, the importance of building footprints in order to, to assess what happened after the, uh, assess the, the damage after an, after an earthquake, to have the precise building map before the earthquake to, to try to understand what is the damage done after the earthquake. We have also another example of a um, of, uh, uh, flat um, uh, in Germany. In here, the the key institute data is the the river and river depth uh, data for the for the models, and as well to measure the extension of the of the flat and the water depth. And finally, as well, uh, an episode here uh, down to the to the right, uh, an episode of a windstorm in Slovenia. Uh, the importance of foreign stand foreign st uh, stand reference data in order to assess the damage after a wind storm. Uh, of course, uh, those working in the Copernicus Emergency Service, you you know very well the challenge of getting access to this institute data. We have an overview, of course, of these challenges and opportunities. Definitely, uh, Copernicus Emergency Service working in, in a very tight uh, time frame, especially when it's when it's about the rapid mapping, no? uh, the accessing and exploiting of in situ data is a critical issue. No? Uh, of course, we find uh, it's found restrictions when it comes to accessing uh, in situ data um, due to uh, login issues, infrastructure restrictions. Maybe sometimes it's needed to have some kind of ad hoc development to get access to the data. All this is clearly a challenge. Also, of course, the lack of consistent, uh, consistent accessible or incomplete reference data set. Uh, also differences in coverage, accuracy, problems of li licensing. Uh, also when the data is there, sometimes it's, it's difficult to get data within the correct time frame, which is interesting for the product, or it's not calibrated, or the format is not actually the, the, the good one for the product, uh, and so on. Um, clearly, what, what I wanted to, to highlight here is the, the 
that the quality of the products can be basically uh, significantly improved if we can have access to uh, data sets uh, higher resolution uh, produced for example by, by national authorities we have sometimes issues to get access to this data and in that sense Copernicus in situ component we are trying to to uh, to create and sign agreements with with the authorities with the national mapping authorities to improve the access to this data um, and uh, try to facilitate uh, the, the use by the different services I wanted also to to mention that uh, to to exploit this as well uh, we have noticed as well uh, the importance that uh, that the harmonization in terms of of content uh, in, in terms of semantics as well that has been done at national level thanks to the implementation of the inspired directive this has facilitated as well the uh, integration of data coming from different countries. Um, another of the work that we are doing, and that was actually the original title of my presentation, is actually the uh, Copernicus uh, Reference Data Access uh, Portal. Uh, this portal is actually, uh, the idea is to provide operationally ac operational access to in-situ data if restricted to Copernicus services. We, we don't host the data here, we provide, the, we curate, provide, monitor the URL and the access uh, to national and subnational data. Um, well, we have almost uh, 2,000 data sets from almost 300 uh, data providers and 6,000 data services. We have a team behind monitoring and extending and curating and improving the content uh, of the of the system. And actually, I uh, wanted to, to inform uh, that we, we are now signing a new four-year framework contract to ensure continuation and to ensure as well the good uh, collaboration that we, we know that the team has with the different service providers, in particular with the Copernicus Emergency Service. Uh, another of the products that I know is particularly interesting for the emergency services is what we call the multi-country data sets. Uh, here there are databases, uh, geodatabases uh, in geopackage uh, as well in geopackage format of data sets coming from national authorities and subnational which are inspire compliant and that thanks to that we can integrate in a unique database um, with an inspire simplified model let's say which uh, contains the field and the attributes which we know are relevant for the services, in particular for the emergency service. We are creating this, not a complete task, but we are creating this for a series of topics such as standing water buildings, administrative units, water course, wetlands, and land water boundary. I will skip this one, but just to, to say that we also monitor which kind of data sets in Corda are most looked for by the emergency service and clearly hydrography, ortho imagery, elevation and buildings and, and on the top of the data sets looked and sought by the uh, services. And I wanted to conclude here with uh, another of the key activities that we are carrying out uh, now. And you may know that already in the past, uh, the EA on behalf of the Copernicus Service signed an, uh, an agreement with Eurogeographic in order to improve the access of from the national uh, mapping agencies data to, in particular, specifically to the emergency service. Um, this is now being revamped, so to speak, in order to try to uh, facilitate the administration of this uh, agreement and also to, to extend this agreement to the other services. Um, so now we, uh, we are about to sign this, this new agreement, so to speak, and Eurogeographic is signing particular or, um, let's say, individual agreements with the different national mapping agencies with different annexes corresponding to the data requirements by each service. In particular, in the context of the emergency service, you can see here what is basically what we included in the first agreement that we signed back in 2017, but basically we are uh, obtaining the access for only for the use of the service uh, of orthophotos, raster, uh, maps, and a series of vector data sets of different topics which are clearly relevant for the service, as well as, of course, digital elevation models. Uh, my final uh, slide is uh, just to uh, yeah, highlight the importance of in situ data in Copernicus, and particularly those data which coming from authoritative uh, sources, in particular, um, for example, national mapping agencies in the context of, of the emergency service, uh, that we are a service here at the EA working for the Copernicus services, uh, providing all support that we can give in terms of, of requirements, in terms of uh, getting access to data, um, 
and uh, that we are working in order to 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 engage national data providers in order to to make them understand how important it is to get access to this data in particular in the context such as the 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 copernicus emergency service uh that's all uh, from my side uh thanks a lot and i'm happy to respond to any questions thanks.